can you, can can you, you explain you? something about what your own job is in this environment? Are, are you uh, doing result, uh, research in this area or, or are you leading a company or okay. part of a company? I, I am both. <laughs> I am essentially, I'm a coach. Uh, coach. Executive coach. So I, what I, uh, what I do, uh, a big part of my time is to help organizations and individuals to get better at whatever they believe they do. One of the things that I do more often is to coach individuals who are living in those cultural environments uh, and help them make sense of what is going on for them and whether they can do something to improve their their life. <coughs> Uh, but I do own a company uh, which is actually training managers and people in becoming coaches. Mm -hmm. Train them what it has to be done. Um, and I lead consultancy work in helping particularly government in changing their assumptions on how to benefit from the global economy. So they are the three things I do. And, and, and do you do, how do you do that to train people to become more global? acceptance or, or whatever, do you have them test cases or, or do you mm. ask them questions or how do you do that? Well, um, it, it depends on the level that, 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 that uh, it depends on the level of what I'm working and depends on the reason from what I've been brought to the company. If it's an individual level, it's all about themselves, it's about uh, basically engaging in a conversation where the main theme is about giving them a space to express themselves and ask questions to do that. Yeah? And it depends very much on the person, how this evolves. But basically, it's being able to let them explore by themselves what is going on for them in, in, in these different kind of conflicts. If it's on a consulting level, it's actually trying to bring examples of the impossibility of not being global. It's just impossible. And if it's not, if it's not the case, what you should, this is, we're talking about government level. At that point, what can you do from a policy point of view that actually takes into account the fact that you have uh, a global economy and global trade flows. And, and more often than not, the resistance to change is not in the understanding. <laughs> it's that you're asking people to let go a way of doing they've been doing for 50 years, <laughs> and they don't feel comfortable stopping doing that. Yes? I'm interested to, uh, to have more of your thoughts about global culture. From the presentation, it seems that global culture is something very airy and uh, abstract mm -hmm. in comparison to local cultures that are the real situations that yeah. you relate to. And uh, I had only one thought about it, whether global culture is another name for a meta toolbox that will allow us in the future to relate to other local culture in a more systematic manner, but I would like to hear more about what, what you think. You mentioned it uh, quite a few times, but... Yes, it uh, uh, that's a very valid thing. question. Thank you. I actually, I've, I've never thought in terms of meta toolbox, but it's a, it's a good idea. The only thing that uh, for me would, I would if, I, if you don't mind, I start from that angle, to, yeah. uh, replying, is, is that uh, I don't think there would be a time anymore when we have the distinction between the local <laughs> and the global. Uh, I, I think that what, what is going to happen is that we, we converge to a situation where our, our local is our global because our relationships are those which we use in a global context. Um, and, and still, there might be uh, a physical environment where we do have an element that is local. And, and yes. there will, and, 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 but, but less and less. How significant it will be compared to the global? This is the question. How well, significant it will be? Because from what you said, I learned that the more significant now is the local. And it's always one locality versus yes. the other locality and all the conflicts. But I think it's going to be less and less important. Uh, first okay. of all, because I, I, I do believe that, I mean, I'm, I'm not joking when I'm saying this, I mean, uh, this conversation can happen, and it has happened in a village of 500 people in the nowhere in China. Now, if, if, if the ability to connect to one socket team in Spain has that, how long will it take for people to actually be integrated in different places? But not only that, 
I think that there will be more and more, first of all, a big mass of population will be in the cities. A big urbanization yes. is the city, and, and cities will become mega cities, multicultural uh, environments. I, I don't think that I can figure out any city in the world that is local. Now, there will be elements that are local, but when you have, I mean, <coughs> think of a mega city like Brussels with 40 million people. Now, Brussels has 40% of expatriates. 40%. I mean, it's difficult to know what Brussels is, really. I, I, I very, live very comfortably in Brussels because I choose my relationships in a very diverse context. Now, put this in 40 million. Put this in 80 million. That, for me, is what's going to happen more and more. We will be able to self-select much more what are the needs that we need for feeling okay. And we will rely less and less on a local environment, less and less on our traditions, more and more in what we can build through our lifestyle. So, so do we see an emergence of a global culture or an emergence of ecologies of a multicultural, multicultural environment? It's not, the same, it's not the same thing. It's yes. because I, I, I come back to the definition that you gave to culture, something that we pass mm. on to children and yes. friends, etc. Uh, because it's a toolbox of working, beha of good behavior. So, do we see? Do you think we see an emergence <coughs> of a global in these mega cities? The emergence of a global culture, mm -hmm. or the emergence of diversity, global uh, multicultural ecologies, which is yes. not a, maybe um, it's the I don't I don't think it's the same. It is, I, and I don't think it's the same either. I think that if I look at this only one global culture, it means that there is one meta tool that says for everything. I don't think that that's the change. I think that for me what's happening in, metal, in, in global culture is that there will be another element of it that is that we are trained in the belief that we can let go of our culture, <laughs> that we can let go of our tradition, and that is okay. Hmm? Uh, the more exposed I am to a multicultural environment, the more at ease I am with the idea that I can let go of, that I don't have to be permanently defending particular thing the way I do it. Hmm? And that will change. I think that nowadays, most people that are in the immersion situation have problems letting go off. Because leaving your culture behind is very tight. But I think that the, the, the end of it is going to be more uh, on a meta level, the fact that we accept that you can change, and that is becomes a value. <laughs> Oh, yes. Uh, because it proves to be effective, actually, to change becomes eventually good. We become nomads, yeah. moving from culture to culture yes. without yes. committing to any... Committing as long as, I, as long as it serves me, hmm? as, as long as it is okay. Hmm? There's no need for change. In, in, it is not implicit that you have to be a nomad. It is that if you are, fair enough. There's only one problem, is the problem of language, which is... It's the determining factor in localizing I, cultures. I agree, and I've lived in China, yeah. and y you can't go around with English as you go around in Brussels. You have to actually master Chinese to be able to be even to be exposed <laughs> to China. Hmm? I still believe that English will be a vehicular language for that globalization in mega cities. People eventually are learning English, and English will be that driver. That's my sense. Maybe I'm wrong, eh? but I agree. And ladies first, uh, just like yeah. or beauty first. Thank you very much for the insightful talk. Um, I'm a facilitator for sustainable cooperation, mm. so I have very similar ideas and uh, strive for very similar things in my work. Although uh, the sustainability challenge is much more present for me, and uh, I uh, noticed that I don't hear talk so much. Mm -hmm. So there, um, this idea of uh, local multicultural ecologies um, would be very important. Also in this whole movement of localization, um, rooting yourself to a certain place, for instance, um, but also using, using diversity as a very important resource. Mm -hmm. So. Um, in that sense, I, I would say the next step to um, of letting go of your self-identity, being able to like learning the skill of letting go, the next step is 
um, yeah, maybe it's um, your exposure part in the on, in cooperation and the, the common the um, as a, a, the building of communities which build their own um, traditions and uh, their like, culture, which is in itself inherently um, adaptable. Yeah. So um, yeah, I'm wondering. Is this, do you see this also emerging? Because you were very focused on the uh, global cultural aspect. Mm -hmm. um, but I see a lot this uh, movement of going back to localities. I, 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 I think they are not contradiction a bit. Yeah. I, I think that what is happening is precisely this idea of self-selective identities of cultures. I think that the, the, the access to information and, and the access to travel and contact enables those communities to be formed, but not only at physical level. Um, I, I think that communities are formed at virtual level, and, and, and the more those communities are more active and more interactive and a bigger part of my daily life, uh, the more I will use them as a reference for my self-identification. Um, but I, I, I agree. I, I think that uh, for example, those communities that are form a physical level, uh, uh, I will not. I don't think they're going to be based on traditions. Uh, it's self-selected communities, and, and you will see that. I mean, I had an experience of a group that decided to create a training uh, facility in Greece, and they're coming from US, um, um, Australia, and they decided to meet together and create a community of practice in Greece. Uh, and, and it's growing, and, and, and when you go and you look at it, it's a very small community, and it fits their purpose for them. But it is not come through tradition, it comes to selecting a place to be physical because it makes sense for them, hmm? uh, and, and it becomes a hub for doing training there. Hmm? Yeah, I guess the circle is closed there when you um, create. You let go of the uh, inherent uh, traditions that you've learned to create with all the communities in which you uh, live your life. In each community, each community has to develop their own rituals or traditions yes. that serve their purpose and their most adaptable yes. to be able to be sustained. Yes, and I think that the change at individual level that for me would become a value is that we would be more uh, adapted to navigate through those communities without feeling particularly in conflict. That would be paradoxical that I belong to different elements, but nobody cares too much, and I don't care. Hmm? And it's okay, and, and it feels okay to be part of <coughs> different communities with very different purposes and very different settings, and I'm still part of them. Hmm? I think, thank you very much. I think yeah. I have mixer there and... Yeah, I got uh, two questions because <coughs> most of uh, it is about uh, organizations, right? Um, and there are two trends, and I think one we kind of all already talking about that. And I was wondering uh, what your insights are about those trends related to how the organizations are dealing with it. So let me quickly give the two trends. Yeah. The, uh, one is, like I said, you have these communities, and uh, what you see is you, there are online projects, and if the project is strong, uh, they often create a strong community. But then I see that this strong community start becoming uh, very local. Um, I, just a few examples. Uh, uh, they create. A, a, it doesn't need to be a fixed local. It can be nomadic, like or, uh, like conferences. Conferences mm. around a certain project that uh, pop up everywhere, but it creates that belonging feeling. Mm. Uh, other things like what you're having in in, in gaming uh, uh, communities where they create groups also with guilds like. To, to play together, you see that they, there's a very social uh, element. I know, for example, that uh, some of them create barbecues. Uh, so it's quite strange because they fly uh, from very different places in the world to come to one place where most are located to have, have a barbecue over there. So it's kind of, it's very strange to see something from the local becoming, from, from the global becoming local. So that's the first trend I want to see uh, uh, if you have see similar things that our organizations are acting on. And the second trend is it's uh, related to younglings, right? Who, who basically are still creating their culture and by observing. But what I've seen is there is that because of the new technologies, that because the, the internet as an interface to the global, um, they start using that as an extended self. 
they are uh, what I see is that uh, I, I see that with, with uh, there's a there's a student organization that pretty much involvement and the way they are using all this media all this all this technology it's uh, it's an extension of, of, of what we used to be mm -hmm. they, they, they don't just uh, uh, create an event they uh, create an event by first announcing it globally mm -hmm. and, and so so I had the feeling there when you were saying like uh, it's a difference between the local and the global that they don't make that difference so much and are more like that uh, real versus built culture but then the, the local versus global culture so it, it seems like they're mixing that up and creating this extended mm. culture building for for local you see what i mean i i, I think so, so i wonder if, if those two are also if you see that in your um, organization if you see how organizations are changing um, or transforming or having conflicts or my experience would be on, on two levels. I think that it's very different when you talk about small businesses and when you talk about big, big corporations. I think that big corporations more and more are talking about diversity and inclusion programs, which effectively is can we break down how big we are into communities that make sense and they, they fit the overall purposes. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a global massive thing that is trying to become local, but local distributed. But, but local, not necessarily physically. Right? I, I think that what is going to change is more that programs about inclusion and diversity are, they are looking more about community of values or m more than Chinese people or geographic. There are some companies that are doing the programs in terms of geographies, Africans and so on and so forth. Um, uh, and, but, but what is happening in these organizations is similar to what you're saying about the, the uh, self-created or an extended self is that corporations are becoming so broad and so big that people, no matter where you work, your partners are people around the world and, and, and your colleagues are all around the world and, and you start feeling a sense of belonging that is even beyond your corporation. Honestly, um, because you, cause it's difficult to feel uh, part of Siemens where your regular contact is with four people, four different people in four different parts of the world that have a completely different understanding of what Siemens is about. Mm? Uh, and, and, and you start doing that. Uh, I think that what most closely to the second round for me is small businesses. What, what, what I'm seeing in small businesses, particularly those who have something, a service that is related to innovation, is is that they have forgotten, you know, in, 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 in inverted commas, the local market. And they they are born to be local global from the beginning. They, they're not thinking when they create the service on how I feed my immediate market. They, they have already forgotten about the domestic market altogether. I mean they they they, they don't create themselves here. They already develop themselves thinking on who is going to buy my services, and, and, and that in the IT community is, <laughs> is, is you know, software, it's globally. I already start my vision here. Where I am is irrelevant. <coughs> so maybe someone in the domestic market wants to buy it, and maybe I need to play it on my domestic market. Maybe not. I have a, a, a friend who is a tattooer, and his supply chain is all in China. And he has no contact with suppliers in, in in Europe, hmm? but his his uh, still his <coughs> end client is basically here. He cannot tattoo uh, virtually. Maybe someday you could. Now they are here. You can operate distantly, so it doesn't matter having the the machine somewhere. I don't know if that gives an answer to your. Okay, good. I have I have also there before. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. What is your definition? Loving someone because we used it uh, several <laughs> times, and uh, I think that if you ask persons okay. here, you will have okay. as many definitions of uh, persons here. That's a wonderful question because it comes to the core of the difference between concepts and behaviors. I cannot tell you what is being loved about, what I can tell you is how I feel loved. And that's a behavior. That's a way we and you interact. Mm? 
And that would, would be different from all of us. But there will be things that you do to me and I do to you that makes me feel that I'm okay. And, and, and what are those things uh, are unique to me. It, it, it might be things that are... Um, I'm not sure about that. I'm a very relativist about that. I'm not sure there's a, a global idea of what love is about. There's definitely things that we do to each other that want us to be together and carry on doing things together. Uh, and, and that I have a need for you to be together with me. Um, as long as that relationship is fitting that need of believing that I am good, good enough, I still feel love. But what particularly is about is is unique. I, I I can tell you how I feel love. But but but, but, <laughs> yeah, but, John, but John, you started about the culture. You you specified it quite well from the perspective of the child and his relation or her relation to a parent. Yes. And this is the feeling of being protected, being accepted, being acknowledged, yes. all this. And this is, this is, on one hand, it's a powerful uh, assertion. On the other hand, it somehow neglects other kinds of uh, cultural transmission that are not within the family unit from parents to children. Because um, I think that as of today, culture, cultural transmission goes much beyond the uh, uh, parent-children relationship. It's, it's more peer, so peer, peer, okay, a peer-focused uh, yes. kind of transmission. So the love, the love that you were speaking about was a derivation of love, uh, parental love, it is okay. It's only part of the story. Even now, you. I, 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 I agree. Uh, but and that is my experience with individuals in one-to-one -one conversations. Yeah. The impact that this has in the way we assess how our peers are assessing us okay. is massive. Uh, it's, it's much more important than what we think. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I absolutely certain that it's not unique. And, and one of the things that it happens more often in the challenge of real culture is that when you go to a cross-cultural environment, this is what puts into question. Yes, it's, it's what suddenly, oh, watch out. In communist and countries, they try to dismantle this uh, yeah. kind of... Uh, but, but once you are aware of it, and when you're able to say, oh, hold, hold on, this, this, this comes from a particular way of living that is my family, that's my group. Only. Or, or only, or, or I don't have access to the groups. I can have a different assessment from my peers. But for that, you have to be aware of it. If, if you're not aware of how your family context is shaping the way you assess the world, you, you, you just also are assessing your peers according to those criteria. This also anchors the locality of culture, yes, this family and group yes. relation. It anchors the locality of culture. Otherwise, we would not have problem with a global culture. I, I, I definitely. So here it, it, it's uh, something that needs to be further penetrated. This this point and it's significant to the whole picture. And and I think that the more, I, I, I there's always an anchor. I mean, I, I even if you explore that, they always anchors. But I, I I believe that the more you are able to articulate what your real culture is about the easier it is for you to let it go and, and take something new. Agreed. Yeah? Um, Phase into and, awareness. And, 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 and the more you're able to articulate your real culture, you're also able to understand better the feedback you're receiving from your peers. Because you're not filtering anymore or you're filtering but with a different eyes. Hmm? Um, but, but I think that there is... Uh, the, the group doesn't live in isolation. <coughs> The concept of family in Spain is a shared concept that more or less fits the current situation, the time, and, and, and the people there. I mean, this, the, the, the thing is that the transmission is only through how my parents understood <laughs> what it is to be a family <laughs> for them. Uh, and in how Spain, they, in this culture. Uh, exactly. The but the only interpretation of it. I, I didn't pick up the concept, I picked behaviors. I picked 
that uh, being good at school is good. But the family unit is the conduit that connects you as a young, young as a child mm. to the culture, yes. the yes. time, history, knowledge, etc., tradition. Yes. So this is the still is the. I, I, and what breaks that link is my direct experience. If it's something that I experience, that actually doesn't make that fit anymore. Is that oh, doesn't work. Uh, I liked your idea of the behavioral repertoire as a characterization of identity or culture and not so much the values because values are things that people are not really aware of and insofar that they are aware of they have a very caricatural vision of things that are very abstract but that are made as if they are very concrete well what is concrete is indeed what do you do in these circumstances and that's what I call the condition action pair. That's the condition, how do I act? Yep. Different conditions, you perform different actions. Now you come in a condition where you do a particular action and you see that it doesn't have the results that you expect. Yep. So then we come to the idea of, of, of weaver of the, the meta level. The global culture would be that instead of having this automatic reaction, I recognize a particular context I act, but I'm not aware of why I act like that. It's not because I'm following some value or because I know exactly in this condition I should act that. It's an automatism. The next step is that you become aware that I act because of this condition and because in this condition this action should normally lead to that result. And if then you see it doesn't lead to that result and you think that, well, maybe there's something different about the condition and my action is not appropriate for that condition. Yeah. So that, there you get to the meta level that you're not just automatically doing the action, but you're thinking about the connection between the context or the condition and the action. Yeah. And that means that you can level a reason, a reason at the level with arguments. If somebody asks you, why did you do that? That you can say, I did that because I believe that in these conditions, that action will lead to that result. Yeah. And then we come to the level of reason, which is, you know, maybe I have been reading that book of Stephen Pinker, The Better Angels of Our Nature, in which he tries to explain how violence has almost disappeared from Western culture. And he looks at different mechanisms. One of them is reason, the enlightenment, the idea that you shouldn't just do things because that's what we always did. But you should do things because you have a reason for it. You can explain why in these circumstances you should pre treat people in this way and not in that way. And by starting to reason, you're starting to look hypothetically. If the situation would be different, would I then do the same? You're starting to learn to look at things more abstractly, look at things from different perspectives, and that makes it impossible to look at it from the point of view of somebody from a different culture. Yeah. And the, the other aspect that he that Pinker mentions is empathy, which is a bit a similar mechanism but on the emotional level. The empathy is that you feel like the other person <coughs> would feel in that situation. Mm -hmm. But empathy is not something automatic. It's not something that you would just feel if someone is from another culture. It may not be possible to immediately feel that empathy. But via the reason, you can start to reason. If I would be a Chinese and the family would be extremely important for me, and somebody would tell me that I can't go to see my uh, sick grandmother, then maybe I would indeed feel very unhappy. Yeah, I, 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 I agree. Thanks for that. I think that the thing that I, I pick up on, on, on something that is very important for me are two things. One is that in, in this idea of reason or emotion, what for me makes a difference to is, is that people have to think of very concrete examples, very concrete situations and behaviors. It's not about... Uh, uh, ideas. It's about uh, it's about very uh, specific actions and uh, courses of actions available to you in one particular thing. And I, either you're able to have a conversation about a specific behaviors to apply reason or emotions, or you don't move anywhere. You, you, as you say, you, we're looking about abstract things that are actually not helping for the person to actually be able to see the other, to, to play in reason and in emotion what it is to take those actions. In particular, it's very, very concrete. It's, it's not, you will have to pick the phone, and it's, it's just very, very, very specific. If I have to call my, my grandmother, what are the actions that you would do? Very specific steps. 
and not just ideas I would want to take care of her or, or it's good to take care of her or whatever it is, it's what it is to take care of her physically. Hmm? And only when pe people can actually identify all these behaviors, they can start applying reason and emotions, all in parallel to that. You cannot have reason on an abstract level for me. It's, it's, it's very concrete. I justify my actions, my immediate action, uh, not the reason why I do it. This is my action, and this is the reason why. Yeah, but that's how people by default function. They function without reason. They function in a kind of automatic mode. Yes. That's the thing you do in the circumstances. Everybody around yeah. you has always behaved like that. Your parents have behaved like you have behaved like that. You don't know why, but you know yes. that is the right way. So yes. the meta level is to say, yes, but maybe somebody else from a different culture might look at these circumstances differently yes. and might feel different emotions and different feelings in the same yes. circumstances. Yes. And that's then the level of the enlightenment, when you start to reason about how other people hypothetically might look at things. Yes. And that's, of course, it's, it's more difficult, it's yes. more abstract, it's, it's more cognitively advanced. But yes. if we're speaking about the global culture, I think the global culture eventually will need to yes. move to that level. I, I, I agree, and the, the other idea that I think is, is about context. One of the things I think that global culture will bring to, to, to life is that context will change very much. One of the things that we became in automatic pilot is our context and environment has been very stable. So therefore, behaviors are not tested or unchallenged. I mean, it's, it just enables me to do things automatically because for many years, they have worked. So the fact that they were useful in one particular context has been forgotten. But in a global culture, due to its diversity, context becomes in the foreground, permanently. You, you, you can't forget anymore that this is an action in one particular context. And, and, and that's uh, it, it reminds me of an example that uh, Pinker gave, which he got actually from Flynn, the guy of the Flynn effect. The Flynn effect is that IQ has grown all around the world, but it hasn't grown in all domains. And the domains in which it has grown most is a kind of an abstract intelligence, which Flynn illustrates with the following anecdote. It was uh, a famous psychologist, I don't remember which one in uh, Russia, who in the beginning of the 20th century went to interview people somewhere in Siberia that were still kind of semi hunter gatherers or small farmers, and he would ask them logical questions like, uh, if all the bears that live in polar regions are white, and Nova Zamblaya is in the polar regions, then what can you tell me about the bears in Nova Zamblaya? And then the farmer would say, I would have no idea. I would have to go there to see for myself. But the only bears I know are black. <laughs> but in Nova Zamblaya, I, I really wouldn't be able to say. And the fact is that these people were just reasoning purely concretely on the basis of their own experience, these kind of hypothetical situations like all bears in polar regions are white. If you've never seen a white bear, it didn't make sense to them. Yes, that's a wonderful example. And, and, and what he said is, if you would now ask these kind of questions to people in the world, most would answer it correctly, according yeah. to our rules of logic. But it's not because people have become smarter, it's because people have learned to take a distance from the very concrete context and to look at things from a bit more abstract level or a bit more hypothetical way. Yes, yes but does this mean that the, the wiring of the brain has changed, no? Isn't I it? suppose it has, you know. But there, there, are oh, some, the brain. Uh, there are some, maybe it's within the limitation of plasticity, but it means that the wiring of brains is changing in order to to apply this level of meta meta thinking and reasoning? Mm -hmm. well, every cognitive change, by definition, changes something mm -hmm. in the brain. If you learn something new, then mm -hmm. you rewire, but how deep the rewiring is in mm -hmm. this case, I, it's difficult to say, I don't know. But, but Seems I pretty fundamental. But, but that's a fascinating idea that, that to become global, and uh, so we have concept of the global brain, you actually see that local brains uh, have nothing. Yes, and it's not. It's also asymmetrical because I can see this uh, guy, this hunter gatherer from Siberia, maybe learning to reason in a more abstract level, but 
I find it difficult to see how it can go the other way around. That someone is, who is already proficient in abstract thinking will go back to some kind of a concrete way of... Probably not, it's probably... It's, not it's asymmetrical. Yeah. There is some asymmetry in it. I'm not sure I'm not sure you can get, get back. I think that that you discover the advantage and then you will not go back to something which is less advantageous. But it depends on what what, what do you do with your life. Because if, if, if eventually you decide, well I'm 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 done with internet, I'm going to live in a farm in Siberia, <coughs> if I go back to you twenty years after that and if I've only been dealing with black bears, you don't care anymore about white bears. I'm not saying that you're going to say, I don't know how they are. They will say, oh, come on, John. <laughs> Who cares? My bears are all black. Um, so uh, I think that the, the thing is that what I believe is that most of us, if not the majority of us, will be exposed to global context. And therefore, we will apply those after thinking and, and, and because it will be useful. <laughs> it is useful in that complexity. Hmm? But for those who are not involved in that global context, if there are any, which I doubt, but if there are any, there's no advantage. Or if I am able to disconnect from the global experience and be local, then I don't know. I, I, I don't know that we have enough data to see what happens when it goes backwards, because it has not happened. Or, or I don't you need, you need a dish where, where that can happen. And maybe, I mean, just thinking widely, but the, the world may be too small for it. I think. But you, you know that there are plans to colonize Mars, and that can be an issue. And still, you, I don't know, I don't know how we can fantasize about it, but what would be the level of connectivity with, with all the people here? And, and, but yes, it would be a degree of isolation where... There, there is a whole plan to, to start uh, sending colonies that never return, so... And they will become be extremely local because yeah. probably nobody in Earth can understand the challenges they face. I mean, they we may understand them rationally, but not emotionally. Okay. Uh, and and so they. That's why I think yeah, it could be. Possibly. Yes, I think I think there was there was a, no. Okay. But what about um, culture of big corporation? Yep. They are their own culture usually, and, and it's usually based on a special network which is really is quite centralized. Yes. In one way, those uh, networks are local countries also because they are coming from, uh, I don't know, uh, Mountain View or yeah, yeah. from uh, some Paris or Tokyo. Yes, and, and I think that's the challenge for the corporations. Still, they haven't get around that. Mm -hmm. and, and, and they are very ethnocentric. I mean, and, and it makes sense. If, if I have grown from a business of a thousand euros to billions of euros doing things one way, I believe my way is good. And I want to ex explore that way all around the world. Um, but, but it's not happening that easy. I mean, they're finding lots of problems to get things done regularly. The, 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 the rotation, the turnover of general managers abroad is super high. I mean, they, they go for three years, they get back. There, there's no way to get things uh, sustainable. In China, for example, it's unlikely to find that corporations have managed to have a Chinese general manager. <laughs> They're still relying on, on externals because um, they still believe there, is, there has to be a way of doing that is better than the other, and, and they turn to export it. But there's a lot of conflict. I mean, there's an enormous investment in big corporations about how do we deal with global cultures? How do we deal with global teams? How do we deal with diversity? It's, it's, it's really top of the agenda in, in HR departments. They haven't yet figured out how to do it. Uh, I, I, I would be very, very interested to see how an organization like Google handles their teams, because they are very open and, and, and and virtual in the way they operate. And see how, I mean, Google is, is a big thing, so let's see how they organize themselves. Mm -hmm. and, and if there's any learning for other companies. Um, but, but things are changing also very fast, because also ownership is not any more very clear. Uh, before it was very easy to say, yeah, uh, Kempinski is a German chain of hotels. But actually, the owner is from Singapore, owned one third, and, and, and people are losing their sense of belonging to a country. 
to a particular way of doing, which still for me is very much related to the cultures of, of, of companies, big corporations. If any corporation says no, we're global, that's not true. And most of the big corporations I've met, they have a very clear identity <coughs> where they come from. Are we Americans? Are we Europeans? <laughs> are we Asians? And, and, and they are very clear about that. Mm. And those are the values they try to put together. Mm. Is there a, a, a link between the, the culture and the shape of the nature? Of the organizations? Um, I, I think there is. Uh, my experience, I mean, is very limited, I accept, is that big organizations tend to converge to a way of doing and is, uh, is more um, uh, we, we want some values to be core values of the way we do things and then we figure out a system of collecting data and information that somehow justifies those values. I think that they are in, irrespectively of how they are organized. I think that the difference in that, in a structure, is size. That makes a difference, more than how they organize that size. Because there are limits of size, and even if you have a very hierarchical uh, organization like Huawei in, in China, it's a vertical, there cannot be more authoritative organization ever, they face exactly the same problems that a very horizontal one like Novo Science, that is Danish. Very similar. I mean, the, the way they express things is very different because one is very vertical, the other one is very horizontal, but the challenges are very similar. Um, it's not very big different. What changes is the size. If, if you have um, a smaller organization, then you see that the structure does make a difference. But then, when the, you're very small, values are not that abstract, are very practical things, are behavior based. In big corporations, values have become already abstract thinking. They're not anymore, not necessarily connected with the way of doing. In the small organizations, it's obvious. This, this value means this, 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 and this, and we do it every day. Uh, what does it mean integrity in a corporation like Siemens? Absolutely no idea. If Siemens is the first uh, company in the world of bribing Chinese officials. So how, how, what it is being, I mean, I don't know if that's true. It's an example of Siemens. I mean, what, what I'm saying is that most corporations bribe in China. But they are all transparent, abide for integrity. Um, those, I mean, at the end of the day, the person that has to get the business done, and the only way around is to give money to a particular official. How that connects with a big value, I don't know. Hmm? If you're a small organization, it does. Very much. Because you, you have actually to make a choice and that and discuss about that choice. That's my experience. Um, yeah. This is to take a step back, talking about that disconnect and uh, uh, sense of belonging that you talked about. In America, there is almost no sense of belonging in a lot of ways because, for one, you're taught from a very early age that the land that you're raised on is not your land, it's not the land of your ancestors, but the land that your ancestors took from others. So you have this intense sense of disconnect. And then immediately, most people move states either multiple times from a young age or uh, for college or other purposes where they then go through an acculturation process. And so uh, I guess the point I was trying to bring up is that uh, the, this uh, process, uh, the holistic process of exposure and inclusion is very American, uh, at least right now, and it's also a huge problem in the sustainability effort and such like that because of the way that <coughs> uh, that disconnect from understanding where your resources are coming from, where your uh, time and money go after you use mm. them, and such and that yeah. kind of stuff. Yeah. Well, uh, I wasn't aware of, of that particular experience of the American culture, which is new to me. Um, very interesting to know of the lack of belonging to the land. Um, but, but, but I guess that there are many other elements that are elements of belonging to be American, even if it's not your land or um, can be many other things. I mean, one thing is whether your land is something that may create a disconnect, but I guess there are other things that glue you to the idea of being American. Um, <laughs> the church you belong to. The church can be one, and, and 
uh, but there, there are many other concepts of the idea of freedom. I mean, I haven't found yet an American who doesn't feel particularly attached to the idea of freedom the American way, or whatever way it is. I mean, I'm not saying that is debatable. Yeah? Yeah. yeah. So there, there are other elements of belonging. I mean, that I, I do believe that there's always a disconnect in, in the way we belong to things. Um, and, and that's an interesting reflection because I do believe that in a global culture there will be many elements in which we feel disconnected or, or we disconnect with, but it will matter less because we have more ability to belong to other things that we select. Hmm? We're disconnected to the things that we don't want to be connected with. Makes sense, or? Just to Okay. Uh, get last. Yeah? Get last. This is very late. <laughs> <laughs> Did you finish already? Hi, um, and if there are no more questions, I'm done. Well, I guess I have a I, Oh, sorry, I, I yeah. thought that you were raising the hand to do it for the time. No, no, no. <laughs> I know the time. <laughs> you know, assumptions, uh, yeah, you, you said a uh, few times, I guess, that uh, the conflict will be... I mean, the conflict is very uh, important hmm. when you are learning new tools, or yes. say, giving away your <coughs> usual toolbox, and then... So, it will be very important in this multicultural environment which kind of implies that <coughs> we will be constantly in conflict, both yeah. internal and external, whatever. So what, what is the implication for, let's say, society? How do you see that? But I, I don't see conflict as a negative thing. I think that the way we react to conflict can be negative. If conflict, <coughs> what creates a negative impact of conflict for me is that if I am very much attached to a particular way of doing and is put into question, and conflict becomes, my emotion can be highly emotional, violent, or anger. Because I'm not ready to let go off. And that is the problem. The conflict in itself is just showing <coughs> me that my toolbox is not complete. But that's how usually people react to conflict. They, they, they get annoyed, they, they, they run around, they, they do crazy things. Yes. And that will happen. And you, I, well, yes, but I believe it will happen less. I think that, that some of the things that we have to be focusing now if we're looking at multicultural places actually help people to be more aware of their internal processes, amongst them, anger. What happens when my real culture or when my assumptions about the world and what is a good behavior are challenged? Challenged to a point that is not just <coughs> theoretical, it is practical. And we, I believe that the future would be, we would be in a situation where people are so used to that, that that won't lead to anger. We would lead to more puzzlement of, oh, how do we go from here? Um, because we would not have a very strong attachment to one particular way of doing. We have a self-selected way of doing that are permanently changing. Things that, wow, okay, whew, that, okay, I was thinking that way not so much now. Hmm? We will be gravitating and navigating into things. And the more we navigate, the less problematic is to get into conflict. Actually, conflict will be potentially useful to say, well, because I never thought that this could be happening. It was, wow, tell me more. Um, so there will be no conflict? Well, what, what, what I'm saying is that a way of handling conflict will be different. I'm not say Maybe instead of calling it conflict, you might call it dissonance or inconsistency yeah. or something. Maybe like it's the term. For me, conflict and, and what you call it dissonance is, is, is the experience that, because of the toolbox that I have, I cannot anymore coordinate with you in a way I want. And I might, in the extreme case, just take the pistol and shoot you, and <laughs> that's over. I mean, because I, I, I cannot cope with it. Or, on the other stream, I can take the pistol and shoot myself. Then it's also no conflict. I mean, but, but what I mean is that we will, have, we will learn to handle it differently. We will be able, because we're aware of what is happening for us, and we've been exposed so many times to differences, that it won't be that important. It would be that important I have to take the gun, or that I have to be angry. It would be more of, uh, again, I mean, again, I'm finding my boundaries. And then, again, I'm feeling a situation where 
can get around it. And probably I will just decide either to, this is not a culture I'm interested in, I'm going somewhere else, or no, oh, well, it's interesting. I want to explore more why Victor has, is making me feel this way. Yeah, the better idea. <laughs> I, must, I, must agree. I actually like the, the, the idea to reuse the, the, the term com conflict as a positive entity. Uh, yeah. so because it's basically a conflict is something that requires a challenge. And a challenge is something that allows you to uh, find novelty. So you, you, yeah. you turn it from something negative, meaning your toolbox is not working anymore, to an opportunity to uh, extend my toolbox. Yeah. So you're changing the whole idea of a conflict as a negative entity. In, in, a, in, a, in a static world, it was a negative entity because your toolbox, 90% of the time, should have worked, right? But now in a complex adaptive environment, it actually becomes a positive entity because it means you can actually grow. Yeah, and I, and I would defend that you only grow once your toolbox fails. Well, well, as, yeah. as long as your toolbox gives you what you want, no need. No, the, the general principle of learning, you can only learn something if you get the negative feedback. If you always get the positive feedback that confirms you are right, you well, won't learn anything. Francis, is, is negative feedback correct in this sense? Because I mean, I actually liked on one of your slides, you, you, uh, you wrote unexpected feedback. Yeah, uh, yeah that's which an is expert. different from negative feedback. Well, well, well negative in the sense that it deviates from yeah, what you expect. Yeah. No, no, no negative in the sense that it's a negative what is happening. Negative, uh, for me, unexpected and negative here is the same. Is that I normally throw the ball to, to Evo, he gives me back, throw the ball, gives me back. I do it a million times. If I throw the ball, it's out of my awareness that the ball will not come back. If it doesn't come back... Yeah, it's negative in the sense that it frustrates your expectation. This yes. is the negativity in it. That's all. Well, you have expectations, you try to predict, and then yeah. something... Surprising, so every surprise is yes. negative in the sense that it frustrates your expectations. Absolutely, and as, as, as long as Evo gives me the ball, I have no incentive to throw to Clement. Because the ball always can pass. Um. Oh, you want to get rid of the ball. <laughs> <laughs> I find this uh, discussion very interesting because I do believe that um, change happens, occurs at an individual level, um, also for the global context. But taking it back to this question of um, who is a global culture emerging, there I would say um, this, w what we're lacking here um, to make this connection of conflict and uh, global culture is that there is, there, there is a threshold where, and you mentioned it once in your talk, where we are not willing to go further. And for many of us, um, we could call it the universal human rights. And then, um, so this idea of universality, um, does, is it the core of global culture, and is it possible <coughs> at all? And this uh, dissonance, a piece of wish between the local and the global, um, I, I really like your approach of um, a toolbox as, and we need to develop new methods to deal with this, um, country, with yeah, uh, dissonances in local behaviors, but is there, a threshold of local behaviors that we cannot tolerate and that we will, that we will act against and will not want to use as an uh, input for us to change. And there, I wonder, is it also a matter of methods that we can find methods to deal uh, with these conflicts in a way that it's not only reflective of I can grow and change and learn, but also uh, we can change together. Um, or is it there? Is it really a threshold where okay, this, we can go this far and no further? There is no way we can come together. Um, I think that different levels. I, I, that's wonderful. I think that individual level there is a threshold. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think that we. I, I think that we cannot dismantle all our assumptions about what it is to be a human being. It, it, it just there are some of them are so core that y you can't. So. Uh, I come back to a very simple, if, 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 if in order for me to be with my wife, she asks me that I have to believe in God, I don't, I don't have anything against it, or people who believe. But, but it is so basic to the way I see what it is to be a human being that I don't, that, okay, we can't be together. I mean, because you're asking me to be a different in an absolute, you, you, I mean, you, I can't cope with it. There are other things I can change. Stop smoking. 
good for me. I mean, it will be good for me. I don't know. The things that I, I could change, the things that might not be good, as I perceive it. So, an individual level, there is a limitation in how much we can become global. And I don't believe that from an individual level, there is anything that is universal. I only, always react to my context. If my context happens to be virtual and global because it's what is happening to me, then my interaction may have an impact on parts of the world that are not in my local physicality. But it's local in the sense of my network. My network is my locality, whatever it is my network. Okay? So it's, it's, at the individual level, I'm always local. Are there limits on a global scale? Uh, is there universality? I also have my doubt that there is, I, I think there is a trend where there is an increasing ability to benefit from coordination and synergies. So I think that if you look at what the global world will have is that there is less, um, a better ability to optimize the frictions. Mm? But, but it doesn't mean that it's an individual level. I think this is, it's a longer process where individuals we simply act on our immediate and those ways of we interacting on a more global scale because we have different... No, but there are universal things, for example, that was, again, the book with the history of violence. You can say violence is not acceptable. Mm -hmm. If you consider that somebody who made a mistake uh, in his professional life should get a uh, hundred uh, lashes with, uh, with a whip, yeah, then I can say, no, that's not acceptable. Mm -hmm. but, but there are, but or, for example, Genital mutilation in some cultures that expected that that should be done to, to, to small girls and you should say no that's not acceptable uh, I think there are certain universal values that you can um, I, I'm not sure because you, you hear with somebody who thinks that girls should be genetically yes. mutilated. And you yes. To, and if you, um, but if you want it's to very difficult to see kind of compromise. Like yes. You got, but not as deep as you okay, normally. There won't be global culture, you know? Well, it, it depends how you define global culture. Now, there won't be one yeah. global culture. I don't think that there would be an absolute what is global culture. But something that will, I mean, I, I, I self-select what I want to work. I don't have to be anymore in a country where they mutilate. I mean, just decide I'm not going to be part of that community, period. I have the choice because there's a lot of diversity to do that. Hmm? Um, but there are the huh? Does it not support the ethical question? But uh, in that, I'm, I'm, I'm a very relative because, yeah, ethics is again a, a very interesting concept. But when you, when you go to your lifetime, and you have lived all your life, and you will never leave that context, that environment, what makes you switch? What makes you believe that mutilating girls is bad? That you have a toolbox. It's the idea of a toolbox will... But how did, the increase, beginning. how did you increase your toolbox? Oh, well, yes. If you, if you expose yes. a person to the fact that his culture, his tradition, his way of life yes. is a toolbox, and this toolbox Yes. First, it's limited. Second, the good news that you can change it to choose something else, and this is this is maybe the most important uh -huh. the most important idea, a stepping stone into the meta level. Yes. Because otherwise, everybody will be stuck in his own tradition with the power structures that involve <coughs> also mutilations or I, I, other I things. Okay. But, but two things yeah. happen for me. This is, one of the things important idea. One is that, yes, I agree. What, what changes is the fact that if people believe and, and are aware that what they have is a toolbox, they don't have an absolute, they have a toolbox, then you start mm -hmm. working on that. And the fact that because we have access to information at a global level, the chances that a person will feel that my culture is a toolbox and not an absolute are greater. Hmm? Mm -hmm. But still, if if those, what would make a person move from my culture 
is an absolute, and I'm not even aware that I'm saying that because it's too, I have a toolbox. What would happen? I mean, what makes a person change? Uh, that, but in this case, there are actually some interesting examples. Uh, because I like that idea, that, like, uh, trying to understand that your culture is a toolbox. But the other thing is that if you know that your toolbox is broken, the, the self awareness is, you need to know that your toolbox is broken and you need to solve. So, but what you see with, with like, like those uh, uh, mutilating communities is that, they, uh, that uh, the organizations that try to fight that uh, empower the people from intern, inside the, the community who, who have undergone that drama or uh, are, are, are wanting to change that position. And then they, they've created these public hearings where the people from inside the community expose uh, yeah. to their own community and there are no ex outside, it's all internal. And then you see that it's, it's, it's uh, stimulating the process of self-awareness and, and self-solutions yeah. for a culture to understand that it is a toolbox, it is broken and how to fix it. And I mean, there are some very nice examples. And, and that for me, it involves uh, community, well, uh, community meetings, town meetings. Yes. That's one of the big the, 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 the Communist Party also trying that with the self assessment. But, but I, I think that uh, in any yeah, case, yeah. what is very interesting, I think this is very interesting, is that a behavior stops being good enough when your context starts labeling your behavior as not good enough. Because you're behaving to fit the expectations of your context. And if your context says, no, 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 that, that doesn't sound right. It's the first step to say, oh, hold on. We, we have been doing this for a long time, and now the we turns out to be they and me. <laughs> That's not good. Hmm? And, and, and those community meetings might be a, a wonderful example. The problem is that I still believe there are things that are very difficult to change in the lifetime of a person. There are, there are assumptions that will take a great well, amount of energy for I, I don't agree with that. I think there it, it is about understanding the, the system, uh, understanding the dynamics, and how to uh, create a guided immersion. And it, it's like with those stunning meetings and, and other cases like uh, around the apartheid in South Africa, there are, there are plenty of good uh, practices that all have more or less the same pattern. You need a workspace. That's by the way, one of the things I, I didn't hear in, in your talk mm. is that is the importance of a workspace mm. to create a connectivity. Uh, uh, because I mean, okay, you have a conflict, but where does that conflict happen? Yeah. Right? Uh, so there is a workspace. Mm. Right? Mm. Uh, uh, so, so in this case, I see how they, they have used that as a mechanism to start uh, systematically approaching those uh, how to transform, <coughs> transform yeah. conflicts in synergy. But and you can you can. Analyze the mechanism. I like, I like to call yeah. that. The yeah, but there is, there is. I mean, my experience that is, is much more difficult than what it looks. And, I, and my reasoning of that is, I would argue, is that the difference is that my real culture, my behaviors, is tested behavior. Mm -hmm. is, is they are good. Through years, have proved to be good to be adapted. Doing differently has not been tested. So I don't have any certainty that doing different is accepted. That is why doing different is so difficult, because I don't have yet, unless I do it, the experience of what it is to be different. And I would agree that people have, are not ready to change. What do you do with that? How do you, with a person that is... Well, that, that's exactly what I mean. Go and have, have a look at the, the practices where uh, people that weren't ready to change have changed, and try yeah. to analyze why they, how, what happened, and how it was it possible to change. Yeah. And yeah, one, of the, one of the things I see, if it is about cultural conflict, right? About something in the culture that, uh, that, that from an outsider <coughs> looks wrong, but from, from the culture is the most normal thing to do. Then, then you see that there have been several uh, examples going before us that show the pattern. And the pattern that I see is that you need from inside the community people to step up. Yeah. And you need this, uh, it needs to be uh, taken on as a community. Yeah. So you cannot just say that group and this group, no, uh, you need to bring them together, like the whole, uh, like the, the whole process to, uh, to process the apartheid mm. has also been done with these uh, public hearings. Yeah. And it, 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 it is bringing the, 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 uh, 
the, the aggressor and the, and the victim together and mm. let them speak and everyone should, should absorb and understand mm -hmm. and they need to do that by themselves. So it's, it's, it's mm -hmm. but then you need to see, that it, for me it's very similar to how a person changes. Yeah. Yeah. But it, 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 it's about self-awareness, it's about self-motivation, it's about mm -hmm. wanting to change. But then it is not from one person, but from a culture. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, in every two books are personal tools yeah. who are uh, from the living own. And these are the most difficult to change. Yeah. And they are also the, the one who have the most influence on, on your behavior. And I think that is a, a big problem. Or, or, or a big resource, but I agree with that. If, if there's something I have experienced and I've done it repetitively that it has proved to be good, it becomes very valuable to me. Changing it <coughs> is difficult uh, because I'm aware there, of how useful it is. Well, is it the I mean, chance for a change, actually? Because um, from everything we've been saying, is the, the origin of change or the willingness to change is confrontation. And um, I think today, more and more people are confronted by the fact that everything they have learned and all the good tools they have developed themselves to be successful, to be wealthy, and, all, and so on and so forth, do not actually bring them to the point of, that they're striving for, to just have yeah. a content, happy life. And this inner, so it's uh, looking at the system, the community has to change from inside, so the system of the individual also, when from the inside they realize something is wrong and it's not going where I want to go, that is where uh, yep. seeds of change are. Um, yep. So, yeah. uh, I mean, the, one of the you just made me remind about it that one of the, the, the nice uh, examples that's pretty good documented is uh, the, the the first uh, uh, attempt on the food revolution uh, ever seen. Yeah. It's uh, uh, Jamie Oliver goes to one of the uh, cities and uh, villages in, in the in the state that is a very conservative village, uh, which uh, the highest uh, grade of obesity. And the way he enters it and the way he works it, the mechanism that I mean, I, mm -hmm. I really have been hooked to the, the program because I'm understanding the mechanism. Like first he came in because there were several children lost in, that lost their parents or uh, just had uh, the, the news that they will only live for, for a few more years. And so they are oh, yeah. shocked. They see, I'm living in a, in, a, in, a, in a culture that's killing me, and we need to change. Uh, so it comes from inside. The second thing you see there is that when he, so he's the guy, he's the agent trying to create a guided emergency. The second thing you see there is as soon as he tries to get into the village and tries to, to spread the ID, uh, mm -hmm. there are people that resist it. It goes into a school, uh, there's a guy on a radio station making fun of him. So, but the, the, I mean, I find that a very interesting way of dealing with, with, with these uh, communities is that uh, instead of like going with the people that already like your idea, they, they, they are your advocates, they, mm. their idea, right? Uh, he actually uh, focused all his energy in trying to understand why this other person is, uh, is uh, resisting. Yeah. And going to the people who resist most first, and trying to uh, transform them, and transforming them by changing self. Mm -hmm. And it was, it's, it's fascinating because at a certain moment he said like, once you have changed this person, he's, uh, he's uh, against it because he's protecting certain values, he believes in things and he, he belongs to it, and that's why he's <coughs> fighting for it. Yes. But if you can actually understand why he's fighting for it, and can change your position so that uh, what he's fighting for can be part of, of this system, yeah. You actually have a very tough guy, agent, fighting for your cause, yeah. Yeah. and and he was able to do that. Uh, it's shit like yeah. the, the guy, uh, the radio uh, representative, who made fun of him all day long. Uh, he actually uh, took him with him and went to uh, uh, the fernal uh, and, and looking at the cases, which were like king size bed uh, cases, and he was so shocked from it. That, that changes the way he, and suddenly on the radio he starts making publicity for them instead of trying to break it. Yeah. So it, 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 yeah. But that, that's a nice one because it's yeah, yeah. very documented. You can see all the people yeah. and you just can follow the, the conflict. The, the and it's challenges. called the truth revolution. It's called the food revolution. The first one, because the second okay. one kind of is a total uh, disaster. <laughs> but the first one is a, was a very interesting case.
Good, thank you. No, I have a personal question about how we, in your experiences uh, doing counseling, you found that things like nutrition have enabled or disabled people's ability to transcend their own boundaries when you talk about exposure. The, it depends. Nutrition is a relationship for me with, with our own body. I, the, the, for people that is very much in their awareness and people that is not. Um, what is interesting to, to do in counseling is for people to understand um, how they relate to their bodies, and what kind of relationship they have with their bodies. Uh, for many people, it's completely alien. They've never thought about their bodies as a part of themselves. It's just something that is external and is, and, and when they start thinking that they are doing something to their bodies in a particular way, then they start labeling as goods and bads. You, you don't have to, to bring it what is good and bad in terms of nutrition. You may if they ask you, but, but from the moment they start thinking as a body as something that you have to relate with, and that is mine, and the whole idea of how you, not only nutrition, sport, the way you sleep, Many things come into consciousness of, 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 of what might be the best behavior for me, including my body. Uh, and often, but not always, but some people, uh, in which I might include even myself, learn to deal with anxiety to fru through food. I mean, there's a behavior that has been learned for many years that, that I deal with, with, the, with degrees of, of stress by a particular eating behavior. And and when people are aware of how they eat in relation with the events that leads to that, for them it's a miracle in, the, in trying to, okay, now I am the one driving the way I feed myself instead of the other way around. Before it's a conversation that my body is hurting me to what I'm doing to my body that is hurting me, which is a different relationship. It's me the one giving the food to the body instead of the body giving me pain. From a psychological perspective, this really interestingly ties back to what you were saying earlier about the, or we all have the discussion about uh, the moments where our beliefs kind of take us, and or where we kind of take our beliefs, because um, you have top-down processes and bottom-up processes, um, and the dual mechanism framework of saying that if you <coughs> have that kind of ongoing relationship between your, uh, the you and the the body or the pleasures of the, any of that, mm -hmm. um, it becomes really interesting and mm -hmm. important. So. Thank you. Is this a good place to stop? Maybe, as you could say. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>